So last week we were talking about the essential self and we were talking about this quest for self-discovery and that the challenge of that is to locate and identify the experiencer and the feeler as opposed to just the experience or the feeling. Or And what is that which experiences and feels. And so we identified that as the soul. The soul is the unchanging aspect of the self that registers all of the changes that we go through. The continuous element that observes that which is discontinuous. The uninfluenced essence that informs the influenced. And as the, as the body's cells are constantly being modified, our emotions, our thoughts, our actions, the, the, they're always being modified. But the I, the, the essential I, the essential self that resides within us, it remains the same. So the essential self within us, according to Kabbalah, we consider that eternal. Everything else in our life comes and goes. But our essential self, which is the uncorrupted awareness of being alive, of just being alive, of just saying, wow, look at me. I woke up this morning. I exist. When not overly identified with anything such as the body or the mind, or the heart, it's always the same. It's never shifting. It's never modified. The soul is who and what we are. It's not part of us. It's not part of us that's temporal. It's not part of us that's spatial. It's not part of us that is limited to, to time and space. It's not subjective. It's not dependent on external stimuli. It's the deeper part of ourself. It's the deeper part of who we are that is independent of environmental influences or physical identities. It's the internal part of ourself. It's the part of, our, of ourselves that was there when we were young. And when we were young, we said, I am young. And it was there when we got a little bit older and we said that we're 69 and three quarters, if you remember that, Cheryl. And it's the part of us that says that we're middle-aged or that we're older. And so it's this perennial I, the soul. The soul is the deeper inner self which incorporates all levels of beingness, including the small surface eye. That part of us, that part of selfhood, it's the ultimate reality and the true eye of existence. Now, forever, or as far as humankind can remember we have searched for exactly this we've we've searched for the essential self and if you look throughout history you're going to find that we've come to describe that unchangeable property in so many different ways from the soul we've called it the psyche We've called it the light. We've called it the naf, the sarira. And in more modern terms, we've used uh, the force, our center, our ground of being. I've heard words like life energy. But the truth is, no matter what you call it, no matter what school of thought you're part of, for the most part, it all describes the same thing. It all describes this underlying pulsating reality. 
we're going to call it the soul. I hope that the soul, the word soul doesn't uh, trigger anything for you. We're going to say soul. And you can, again, if it triggers you, you can call it psyche. You can call it light. You can call it the power within. It's really all the same. It's just a word that you use, that you use to describe something. And really, more than the word itself, it's the definition of that word, that essential self, the part within. It's a unique spiritual manifestation with a distinct individual personality. And it's through the lens of our our individuated soul energy that we come to experience life. The path towards self-actualization and fulfillment is found in this discovery. The unearthing of and living in accordance with the infinite spark of the divine that's made distinctly present in our own finite lives. The fullness of the eye of the world, the infinite, it's revealed beautifully in the individual finite eyeness of self. I'll explain it like this. Essentially, our soul is not something that we possess. It's who we are. It doesn't belong to us. It is us. It's not something separate from us. Our soul is exactly who we are. If you had to say, who are you? You are your soul. The soul is the higher self. It's the self of our limitless potential, the part of us that stands above ego, the part of us that stands above selfishness, above aggression, above resentment. Our soul is the backdrop of our being. It's the light that illuminates and it clarifies our thoughts. It illuminates and it clarifies our emotions. It illuminates and it clarifies our actions. It really allows us to vibrate and fill our life with who we are, with what, what, with what resides within. The soul is the observer of life. The essence deep within that perceives life and witnesses it unfold. Now, the known cannot be the knower. The known cannot be the knower. If you know your thoughts, then you cannot be your thoughts. I'm just gonna say this again, because it's so it's such an important element when it comes to understanding the soul. If you know your thoughts, then you cannot be your thoughts. If you know your passions, your emotions, if you know your desires, you cannot be them. There was an important medieval uh, philosophical and, and ethical text that was attributed to the 12th century French rabbi. He was known as Rabbeinu Tam. And the text says that the soul is the knower of the known. I would define this, this is my personal definition of that text, that the soul is the the small voice beyond the mind that impels the conscious mind to think. It impels the conscious mind to feel or to act. It's this, it's some, I don't know, I don't like to call it the gut because the gut is something else. It's like that little voice inside. I think that anyone who's ever dabbled in meditative techniques, or if you're coming to my meditation class tonight, or if you've dabbled into the philosophy or, or, or the mechanics of the mind or psychology, you know 
that the mind has or appears to have a mind of its own. And there are levels beyond levels within the mind itself. So when we tell ourselves to think a particular thought, that's one level of the mind. I would say it's a more surface level of the mind and what the mind thinks. And having this awareness tells us that there's still a deeper level of mind experience and mind consciousness. And it's so important because so often, I don't know if it's fear, I don't know if it's just because it's just easier or more comfortable, but we, we often stay in that very surface level experience and we don't dig deeper. What Kabbalah wants us to do is find that deeper part, maybe the part that's been covered up, maybe the part that we ignore or the part that we've had to ignore because we've been forced to based on our circumstances. And I think that just kind of acknowledging that there's something more to our minds already begins this process to say, who am I? That, 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 that existential question that nobody, you know, we're always like, who am I? Who am I? Well, I'm the soul looking for a deeper, more meaningful experience. Part of that is by digging deeper into my mind. I may want to dig deeper into my heart, into my emotions. I may want to dig deeper into my actions. And the mental exercise of trying to experience this can literally extend itself to no end. And at the deepest level, it's the essence of self, the only essential self there that governs and instructs who we are, essentially that governs and instructs our ego. Because our ego tends to be that shell that covers up the essential self. That's why we often use our ego when we're not confident about something or we're not sure about something. So I want you to, to, to try to experience this. Thank you. I want you to try to experience this by taking a moment to try to be aware of the wall that's nearest to you. Just take a, be aware of the wall. Do you ever notice the wall? Just, just a wall. Now, be aware of that level of mind that is aware of the wall. Now, go a little further. Try to be aware of that which is aware of that which is aware. You can do this exercise over and over and further and further until you reach a point where you realize that there's a part deep within that is, as some tend to call it, the absolute self or the pure witness. And this can never truly be grasped because it is what grasps. It can never truly be understood because it's the understander. It cannot be known on an intellectual level because it's the knower of knowledge. In its highest, in its deepest, most pristine form, the soul, or we'll call it the higher self, if that makes you feel better, is part of that divine I. It's that divine self. It's That's what the soul is. It's part of that higher self. It's part of the reality where the knower and the known are one and the same. This is what the Rambam, this is what Maimonides describes as 
the level of the ultimate or the unconditional beingness. The ultimate or the unconditional beingness. It's the aspect of reality where the experience and the experiencer, where the observed and the observer are one and the same. This level of consciousness is rooted in a place beyond duality, beyond polarity, beyond separation, beyond contextualization. It's similar to the creator who defies and transcends human logic. See, the soul embodies this paradoxical and this entity, I guess it's, it's oxymoronic, or at least the human mind functioning as it does within the constricted reality. The soul is both infinite and finite in its properties, in its expression. As challenging as it may be intellectually to grasp this, you're probably wondering like, what, what exactly is, is this rabbi talking about? Because the soul is simply a finite sliver of the infinite. It's like a holographic particle of infinitude. So this conception violates our way of thinking. And it does so because the brain is basically a binary instrument. So for the brain, it's either up or down, right or left, zero or one, but it's never both or at once. The brain can't, you can't tell me that up and down are the same or that right and left are the same. No, I go right, I go left, I go up, I go down. Zero and one are not the same, but it's only a limitation of the physical brain, which has difficulties navigating or interacting with the universe that allows for simultaneous and contradictory coexistence. And I think it's such an important part. It's, it's a form of maturity. I've spoken about emotional maturity. That's what mental maturity is. That's what intellectual maturity is. It's the ability for two things that may possibly be opposite to coexist within you. Yeah. And they're the same. So on a simple level, it means that although each soul is rooted and sourced with, with genuine oneness, as it emerges, while it still sparkles with infinitude, it becomes quite distinct, unique. It becomes defined. And it descends to become embodied within the individual and the particular human form. And as a result, things that are really one seem opposite. It's not that they're opposite. Up and down are not opposite. For the soul or not, it's just because your human mind being binary decided that it's opposite, but it's not. So opposites are really one. And the essential self, there's a part within you, that thought within the thought within the thought, the knower, the knower knows that there's no dichotomy in that. And that's a very, very, it's, it's difficult to grasp on, on a surface level, but if you go a little deeper, a little further, you're going to say, well, yes, absolutely. It is all one. And imagine if we could live in a world where that's the way we thought. Okay, now I'll take your question. Susie, you've been waiting. For me? Yeah. Oh, you know, you're not waiting? Okay, I thought you were waiting for a question, to, to ask a question. Sorry. Okay. Questions? It's more of a comment. Okay. Yes. I I was listening to a lecture. For this uh, gentleman named um, a professor at Stanford named Sapolsky, and I was struck by we were going into neurobiology, and I was struck by the things that we, our ego, or that we consciously think are our decisions are so dictated by 
these incredible calculations that we have no control over that take place in our brain, chemicals, the, you know, speaking to one another, depending on what projection we have in our mind. So I think that's where this, this soul, for me, uh, the, this discussion of soul, it becomes so important because we can control or consciously thinking what we put our attention on. And there's also chemical processes going on that we really, our autonomic nervous system is in control of. So I think of it like, okay, I'm not going to let my brain be my boss all the time because, well, it's a practice. It's a minute by minute <laughs> practice, but I just think it's so interesting um, because we just have a, a control of a slice of it. And so it, it's just I, the whole thought of just letting it pass by like a wave is, is what I want to put my attention on. It's such, it's such an important, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. And if you think about it, just remember this. And I've said this before in other classes, but I want to say it again. You can only think one thing at a time. So you could choose what you're thinking at that moment. And if you don't like what you're thinking, think something else. The brain cannot process more than one thought at a time. So if you're multitasking, it just means you're, you're forcing the brain to process many things at once, but it's not really processing many things at once. It's just going to take in a matter of one minute, it's going to take, uh, you know, it's focused for 20 seconds here, for 20 seconds there, and for 20 seconds there. So are you going to be doing a better thing? That's a different conversation about multitasking. It, it's, it, so I think in those moments, it, it's, you, you switch into the reacting like your brain just reacts and there's no conscious responding. Yeah. And, and, and I also want to, to uh, acknowledge that there are some people who, for various reasons, uh, due to their brain's ability, cannot function this way. I mean, I think that we come from a place of privilege. There are people who are, are of, special, of special needs and special dispensation who um, don't have this ability or people who are who are who have mental who suffer from mental illness who you know there are certain like like you said celeste there are certain things within the brain that 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 subconscious becomes conscious you know, and 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 that person cannot control entirely what's going on so if, if that's the case if you or somebody you know is part of this then uh, you know the the we're not talking to that person necessarily we're talking to someone who is able to do that and, and I think that it's, it's a gift that God gave us. And it's something that, that um, for whatever reason we need, and maybe that other person has a, a special, you know, we, we call them special needs is because we know that somebody who heaven forbid can't see can hear much better than somebody who can see and hear. So they have special talent and special powers that perhaps we don't have that we can learn from. And, and so we're talking from a wonderful place of privilege that we can actually think like this. So if we can do this while others can't, then what's stopping us from doing it? From living in tune with our essential self. Any other questions, comments? And that was, uh, that, by the way, I was just, an I, I said that because I was answering a question that I got privately. Um, just want to put in the chat that um, any two opposite qualities, they're still opposite qualities, or we might call them faces, but they're, they're rooted in a, it's like a hair on a head. So it's a hair that faces one direction. So the, the end of the hair, one point faces one direction, the other point faces the opposite direction but they're still connected to the same root. Um, yeah, but it's, it's also based on your perspective, which means you're talking about it from a below to above perspective, if we're talking in Kabbalistic terms, which means you're, the privilege you're using is the privilege of being in a world of duality, which is the world that we live in. So you're saying they're opposites because you're approaching it from a world of duality. Well, imagine if you approached it from a world where everything was one. 
Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you mean, but there's also the concept that for everything, God creates an, an opposite. So th there has to be... In this world, in this world, ah. God creates an opposite. Because ah. the reason why is because God created this world different. This world has within it free choice. The definition of free choice needs to allow for two opposites. Because if you're truly going to have choice and you only... And, and God only created one side, well, you don't have choice, and then it's a joke. But in order for this world to truly resonate with the concept of free choice, then there needs to be the ability for two opposites. That's why if you know something that's extremely bad, you have to know that God also created something extremely good. And if you know something that's extremely good, God will have created something extremely bad to give that each and every one of us the ability to have that choice. So thank you for, for, for bringing that up. It's an important okay. element here. You're, you're welcome. If, if I may just add that it's also true in an essential sense, still, as you said, in this world, but because every poison contains its own antidote. So, it, is, it, so it, isn't, it isn't just our perspective or just our choice itself, but God is actually innately in the thing. It may only be in this world, but it is innately because... We, we don't know all the poisons, we don't know all the antidotes, but they have been created as opposite pairs. Absolutely. Maimonides, the first book he wrote was in, in it, it was eight chapters, which was an introduction to the, uh, to the Mishnah of Avot. And in the beginning of the third chapters, the third chapter of that, he says, um, he says two things. He first says, just like there are diseases and remedies for the body, there are also diseases and remedies for the soul, and they are one the same. And he also said that God brings in the remedy before the disease, which means if there's a disease in the world, the remedy also exists. And I love that because I've always wondered why they refer to finding the cure, that they're finding a cure. Well, what, what happened? If you're, if, you, if you're finding something, you must have lost it. What, did, did they lose it in 1972 and they're finding it? No. It's because they know that it exists and they're so certain that it exists, even though they've never seen it, that they're finding the cure. And I always love that that's the terminology that they use with regards to the cure, finding the cure, because they know that it's there. And, and Maimonides backs that up. It's true that it exists. If there's a disease in the world, there is a cure for it. And the cure came in first. And we have to, we have to believe and, and we know in this world how many people suffer and how difficult it is. And we have to believe that there really is a cure and that they're just finding it and they're going to find it very soon. And we can pray for that. Cheryl. Oh, my God, you got me so far back ago. And now I have brain fog. Um, when you were talking about the levels of the knower and the person who knows. Visually, I could think about that person lying in the hospital bed in ICU who is imminently either dying or crossing over to the other world and then your body floating above that or your soul watching all of that and yet it's still part of you, but that part it's divisive and you haven't made that separation. That was my visual. But then later you said, and then there's more, and then there's more, and then there's more. And I can't remember what the more was because that was 20 minutes ago. And I really do have brain fog. So you said, but there was so much more on the soul level if, if of you the wanna... knower. The knower knows more, yeah. knows more, knows more. How do you ever get to that deepness of your own personal soul? To use your, your example of the person lying in the hospital bed, I would use that ex a similar example, but actually somebody who heaven forbid suffers from ALS, mm -hmm. where we know that mentally they're completely there, completely. It's just their body is not able to function. Right. So 
you know, now that there's this amazing technology that allows people who suffer from ALS to use their eyes, to blink their eyes and be able to write. I have a friend who's a rabbi who suffer, who's been suffering from ALS, who uh, writes a Torah thought every single week, a beautiful Torah thought that I read. And that's an amazing place to talk about the difference between the known and the knower and it being one the same. It's only the body that's not able to function. And it's terrible. He's going through such a difficult time and his, his family is going through such a difficult time. And, and if you know anyone in that situation, you know how difficult it is. Yet, if we had to just, for the sake of our conversation, use that as an example, you can see how there's a lot more there. A lot Do you more. see in his writings, do you see the thought process getting deeper? Oh my gosh, it's, it's just pure, it's pure. Oh, it does, okay. It's pure, because he's not, he's not stifled by all of the nonsense that you and I have to deal with. Before coming here today, I, I had to sit in traffic. You know, that's a stifling nonsense that is a reality of life. Susie, please. So he must have such internal strength to, I'm sure there are some moments for him that are hard spiritually, but he must have such internal strength to be able to, to rise above it and to just be so pure like that. That's, that's internal strength that, he, you know, that's beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's, I mean, I, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. And, and um, I, I can't imagine. His name, if you want to look him up, his name is Rabbi Yitzi Hurwitz. I'm going to put it in the, in the chat here if anybody wants to look him up. And he writes a beautiful, beautiful, he's been suffering for a number of years, I would say probably eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's, a, there's a documentary made about him. Uh, his incredible wife and her resilience and standing at his side and his family. It's, it's really, really amazing. You should wow. definitely look him up. He lives in California and, uh, and he writes every week. He writes a Torah thought. Mm -hmm. and, and if you read some of his thoughts, it's just, you see that, that you can talk about the knower and the known at the same time. It's mm -hmm. just there. It's real. I mean, and all he does is he's just lying there in a bed, but we know and we can see that his cognitive functioning is perfect and totally intact. Does he, put, does he um, project it? Does somebody else write this for him? No, he has a computer system that he has yeah. to use. It could take him, I think it takes him 20 hours to write his Torah thoughts because every yeah. it's, it's through the blinking of the eye and he has to do letter by letter by letter. Wow. God bless him. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions, thoughts? Actually, Rabbi, uh, my cousin Tommy in Jerusalem has uh, uh, ALS. And he has and, um, She used to be an and. And in fact, she's very happy to be alive. Yeah. Very, very happy to be alive. She cannot eat. She can't breathe on her own. She can't communicate through the machine. Uh, but she's very happy to be still among us. That's, that's when you can see life in its purest sense. We're all looking for something else. We're all trying to find meaning. And there are some people in the world that are just happy that this morning they can breathe. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful You know, I, I told you, my mom used to, um, as a doctor, her, her job for 25 years has, has been to take care of people in end of life situations. A, and, and she said that even the people that could not connect anymore with their surroundings, et cetera, they still had a light in their, in their eyes. And then she has observed many that 
one day that light would change and within three days we're dead as if mm. the purpose had And she said she has so many, many times. Wow. Yeah. My comment, that's it, I'm done. It's, it's an absolute gift. I mean, look at the fact that we're able to sit here and we're able to even just have that thought and allow that thought, thought to pulsate us and say, wow, just being alive, just being. And, and, and there are people who simply just being alive and having another day of life is enough of meaning for them. Mm. Because I, I, I don't know exactly, I, I just, but I remember him saying, I remember hearing something like it takes 20 hours for him to write a little Torah thought. Letter by letter, all he has right now is the ability to move his eyes. That's it. And I'm not saying that to, 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 to bring sadness. I'm saying that because we have the ability to learn from him and from others like him and from your cousin, Alessandra that just a moment of life is so precious and so beautiful and mm -hmm. so incredible. And that's the power of just being alive. And the fact that God gave us another day of life here today, there's a reason. Oh, you're feeling down? Oh, it's, it's difficult for you? Oh, things didn't go your way? Just breathe, it's okay. Yeah, kind of put it into perspective, huh? Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a call I have to make at 10.30 today. It's about trying to find some challenges that I'm encountering with renovations for the house of someone in France. And I have to tell them it's going to cost them a lot more. And yet I don't want to pay some of it. And, and it's been going around my head like that. And it's driving me nuts. I feel guilty as if I can change a situation which I cannot change, right? And then, you know, this conversation, I'm like, really? Is that what's stressing you out? Money's money. And we all understand that it could be a painful experience. Understood. But you know what? Come on. Is, why are you confused about this conversation? It's very simple. This is what happened. This is what it is. This is what we're accepting to pay. And this is what we're not going to pay. And that's it, you know? But doesn't make it doesn't make sense that one has to wake up in the middle of the night for a conversation no <laughs> it's amazing how very practical things become so emotional and they take us over as if they're the only thing that exists but it's true if yeah you can, it's if you can decompartmentalize it and know that the knower and the known are are, are, are separate then that's a great gift and then you won't be anxious about it and then you won't worry Absolutely. So wish me luck. I have a conversation at 1030. <laughs> yeah. The, the things that we decide are important that I'll just use myself that throw I, the things that I put weight on that I let that I allow to throw me around the room emotionally in moments like this, I realize the ridiculousness <laughs> of it. Um, the last thing is ego related because oh, as, as a matter of fact, um, renovations, we all know that they're going to cost more than what you're, you've planned. Right. Oh Always at married to a contractor. Um, I can tell you that's true. <laughs> right. So, but me somewhat, I take it personally that I may be to blame that I didn't manage this properly enough for it to reach a level where it's costing more and it's not true. Right. So 
but there's that ego little part of me that says, mm, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, but it's, it's not. And I'm, and, and I'm the middleman between the person who's doing the job and the owner of the house. So I feel a responsibility. Yeah, but it's, it, it's mostly, like yeah. We, we are like, okay, this result is good. This result is bad. I, and a little I, I am in control of good or bad. Right. When, when, when but really, not. really, no. it's just a planning behavior. All we needed was planning behavior. You could have just started off by saying, the contractor gave me this number. I'm just going to add 20% because I know that's the reality of it or whatever you decided percentage wise. Oh no, at the time when we signed in my head, I said it was 30% more. Yeah. But it's so, a, that, that's an important planning behavior and it's obviously a different conversation, but that's an important thing because if you create a certain, if you broaden your expectation, then you're not going to have that feeling of anxiety because you already expected it. I expected to have 30% more. I didn't expect to have 45% more. And I didn't expect to have somebody in front of me that may not be in good faith. So next time, make it 80% more. It's just, it's just, it's futile because whatever it is, it doesn't belong taking that much place in your mind that you can't sleep at night. Absolutely. Except when it's not your money, it's more complicated. Right. Yes. And... And yeah, so I'm going to start the conversation at 10.30 saying, as you know, we had discussed it that, you know, we had a 30% margin. Yes, you yes, know? and, yes, and. And this is where we're going. Yeah. Do, do you think that that might, this kind of, you know, goes back to the meditation class that about being in the moment all we can really do right is just be the best version of ourselves in that moment so your phone call you, you i get is this a planning behavior rabbi maybe just just being as honest and and being have responsible communication that you can and the outcome then is is out of your hands so instead of living in just i'm i'm speaking about myself too i i do this a lot like this is how the outcome should look and if it doesn't fit in this box then i have somehow failed again little i um but maybe just do the best we can in the moment and then we have to let go and just let it be yeah they should write a song about that <laughs> let it be let it be let it be <laughs> Let, let it be, even though it has uh, 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 earthly consequences. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. Earthly uh, consequences. I love to go around as we uh, close up today. Get, get, uh, what are you, what are you going to think about this week or today or for one minute after the class is over? What are you going to think about? I want to start with Jen. We haven't uh, heard from you at all. And then you can pass it off. I'm going to kind of cheat and just reiterate what Celeste said, but um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. As someone who is always looking at worst case scenarios and trying to plan for everything, I'm never, I shouldn't be surprised at this point, but I'm always surprised where I think I've thought of every possible scenario, but then something happens that I didn't account for. So I think even if you try to plan, you can do your best efforts, but there's going to be something that happens that is going to throw you for a loop. And so the best thing is just to be in the moment and just expect the unexpected. You want to pass it off or should I? Sorry, um, I'll pass to Susie. Ah, okay. Hang on. Am I on mute? No. Oh, you're good. We can hear you. Okay. So, um, I'm going to Google the rabbi that you mentioned. I'm, I'm curious to hear his story and read what he has to write from a very pure soul perspective. It's, uh, it fascinates me because I'm, I'm, I try very hard to be in touch with my soul, but I'm also 
influenced by my body, by external forces. So that's what I want to do next. Okay, I'll pass it on to Alana, <laughs> my neighbor. <laughs> Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad everybody's so soulful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how pure my soul is. And I, I don't know how happy I would be to be alive to be in that rabbi's situation, to be honest. And, you know, I was just thinking about this um, small, well, it was in, in the news of this woman with Alzheimer's, a young woman with early onset Alzheimer's. And she was asking to be allowed to prepare for her own death, you know, with doctor assisted, uh, doctor's assistance in the future, you know. So I don't know. It's, I, I think it's a huge, Huge issue. I something I you know struggle with. You know, you're 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 one with your soul, but maybe sometimes the soul doesn't want to continue. I know that's not where everybody else was, but that's where I am. Yeah. Alana, may you never know of uh, those struggles. Do you want to pass it on? Hi, Jill. How are you doing? I'm good, Alana. Thank you. Um, as usual, a really fascinating class. And I feel like the balance or the juggling between we live in a finite world and we want to, to connect with the infinite. And I, I've been very, I guess angry is the, the word around things outside of myself, like the healthcare system in our country or the politicians that are running our country. And I'm in this like state of what can I do about it? What can I, little me here in my house do about that? Um, and I get the connecting with the infinite, but I'm trying to be like, well, I've got this, this passion. How do I go into action around this? You know, I think about Alessandra's situation, like, you know, you don't just say to this, this contractor, eh, you know, you're, you're not in your integrity. So, okay, here, I'll pay you all this money. It's like, you've got to be in action to take care of these things in our finite life. So I'm trying to think about how do I, how does that manifest? What does that look like for me to still stay connected with the infinite? But meanwhile, I'm just so annoyed <laughs> at how our systems run and I periodically get like this. Um, so that's just my, my question, my quandary and uh, what I'm challenged with right now. So it's given me some, some things to think on here. So pass it to Kelsey. So good to see you, Kelsey. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so this actually kept reminding me of a class we've had, um, a few months ago, I think maybe several months now, but that we are just the character in the story and that we really don't control anything, even though, you know, things happen to us. So that just kept coming to mind. And I think that's something that I want to focus on for the future too, that, I just need to embrace the moment and see what God has in store for me. Um, Celeste, do you have it? Did you give your nugget or did you just speak? Not, not nugget yet. Nugget, <laughs> nugget. I agree. Nugget is listening to everybody's nuggets. Jill, I really appreciate what you shared just now. I relate. I want to try to not get for today, after this class, I will take a moment and remember to not get too caught up in the in the fight, in the in the in trying to control the outcome and just focus on action steps. Uh, Cheryl,
Thanks, Celeste. I only thank God that we only have one thing that we have to say today because after listening to wanting to look up this rabbi and his words of mism, and my phone is blowing up with contractor info that needs to be done before the Monday that we are leaving this Monday. And Bruce and I got COVID Saturday night. So we're kind of dealing with all that and hoping that we're better to be able to go back to Chicago on Monday. I just want to go to sleep and forget all this right now and revisit it later. So that's my one thought for the day. I thank you all for all of your nuggets, but I'm going to have to listen to it later because I'm falling asleep. But thank you. I wasn't keeping track. Who hasn't had a chance? Fami, Fami. Fami, uh, Alessandra, Julian. Okay, so, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I, uh, so I was thinking the same thing as, as I mean, uh, for the couple of weeks. Like, uh, so uh, what, 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 what Jill is talking about. Uh, so. We are not finite because we are infinite. We are much less. We are infinitesimal because, like, if you do the the, the ratio of something finite against something which is infinite is zero, right? So we, we are nothing. So how can we how can we uh, do a contribution? I think, uh, uh, Gilles, if you have time, uh, there is like great great lecture by Rabbi Sachs. Uh, like on uh, mishpatim, right? So, so uh, I mean, so the only way which we can or we hope to contribute is by positive, uh, trying to, I mean, to reach the people heart and minds and try like to change things by changing their behavior. Uh, because like we are so small, we only can do so small things. We cannot do like, uh, we cannot do a lot. So, for example, like he was giving, Rabbi Sachs was giving an example, like uh, you are in a, like with, the co with colleagues and you have a shared kitchen. So, and it happens that these people like, let's say uh, uh, junk food, right? So how can, we, how can we change that behavior? The only way is like, maybe you, you can put small, like uh, small like items, which are like good things and, and they shine by themselves. So the only way we can contribute, this is what Rabbi said, and I agree with him, the only way we can contribute is like by helping people to make the change themselves, not, not, not trying to enforce it. This is the only, and I have to agree with him. This is actually what the Mishpatim, like the part of Mishpatim said, because like even if you are a slave and you, if you want to stay a slave, you will stay a slave. You, you cannot force people to change their, uh, their behavior. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, it's not me. <laughs> a little more light, a little more light, that's it. Yeah. Julian, do you want to say something? A little nugget? I put it in the chat, is, is that all right? Um... Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you, we, we see it here in the chat. Thank you so much. And uh, Alessandra, we'll finish with you. So I want to learn to find that soul. And uh, I see that while I know anxiety actually is lack of trust that God is over present with us and, and gives us what we need when we need it. So sometimes you know, during my day, my work day usually, I have peaks of anxiety because that are not related to me lacking trust, but I believe, but are related to me being overwhelmed with the task at hand. And so I just stop. Sometimes I say, okay, that's it, stop. You're like You cannot build on that anxiety, which is useless anyway. It doesn't help you perform better. So just, and, and I take a breath and I feel like 
God has given me his breath again, you know, like you have been given life when we're given life. And really, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to think is whether my soul is reminding me, hey, 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 I'm here. Don't, don't, don't get lost because I'm here. I'm always here. Uh, so it's, it's questionings that I have following this conversation. I attribute it to the breath as, as you know, a, a sort of breath of God that says, hey, hold, hold your horse. But it may be, you know, just my soul. I mean, just, it may be my soul reminding me, hey, it's okay. We're, we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. So these are just uh, earthly matters to take care of. And you're capable, it will happen. So, you know, going back to that trust and then, you know, anxiety versus trust. And then what I put in the chat, you know, my voice is dangerous. I think that what I hear with a proper voice is my animal soul. <laughs> That's what I would say. Because my animal soul usually tells me, buy this, buy that. <laughs> buy so I'm thinking, this is not your soul talking to you. This is the other side. So breathe before you act on the voice. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to throw in there. I'm so sorry to interrupt before anybody leaves. My husband spends a good amount of time donating his, his time on the phone to, for people who are having issues with contractors. Um, and and helping direct that kind of thing. So if anybody needs help, I put my email and I'll hook you up with my husband. He'll happily help. Thank you. That's Thank nice. you. That's very kind. I'm sure that there there must be similarities between what happens in Canada and what happens in the U.S. And Sounds like it. So I will definitely. Yeah, I will definitely call him. But before, before I told the contractor I wasn't paying him, I called the protection of the consumer a, and I checked with them that I was in my right set of mind uh, with refusing to pay some things. And, and I am, so I'm standing on the right side of the fence, but like everything, it can become a fight and fights are, you know, take energy of you. So I, I, I'm trying to be right on the one hand and fair on the other, but it's difficult to do that when it's not your wallet. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I, uh, I should have put letter connection instead of letter connection. Yeah. I'm sort of slightly veering into Camatria and stuff by doing that. But, oh, that. I saw yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, no problem. But 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 did you think it relate could relate to the heart? It was just a, a guess of Absolutely. elimination. Absolutely, it definitely makes sense. Absolutely, Julian. I want to uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, and uh, I'm definitely going to take a lot of what you said in account as we continue this conversation next week, and I think I'm going to incorporate some of that into it. So I, I look forward to continuing this and looking uh, you know and and looking at this uh, in, a, in a deeper way. So uh, have a great week and to be continued. And all of you who are staying for Talmud, let's get started with the Talmud. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Good day. Um, so Thank you. Bye. Bye. So, so I didn't realize there was another class. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it another hour, is it? Another hour, another hour. We have another class, Talmud. You're welcome Could to join I us. Or Could you, I, yeah, yeah, I'd like to try it because okay, it's been a new experience. No problem. It's a it's it's, it's a text based class, but you're welcome to join. Thank and, you. Uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, on we're doing the Talmud and Brachot on forty B. That's where we are. <laughs>